Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar entitled Optimizing the Fulfillment Process in the Context of ASC 606, featuring Tyler Technologies, ChangePoint, and SoftTrack. I will start with a quick overview, then I will introduce today's speakers from ChangePoint, SoftTrax, and Tyler Technologies. Today's webinar is approximately one hour. If time permits, we will have a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. We do encourage you to submit questions via the questions box in your GoToWebinar control panel. In the event that we run out of time, a speaker will follow up with you after the webinar. Today's presentation will be recorded and made available on demand. A link to the on-demand version will be sent out to all attendees within the next 48 hours. CFOs have long described the operational challenges they face, particularly when closing their month, quarter, and year. Among these challenges, the collection of fulfillment data, for instance, the satisfaction of delivery events, service milestones, or percent of completion. These and other metrics that trigger the recognition of revenue has been described as the long pole in the tent of the closed process. On top of that, CFOs now have to contend with a new revenue recognition guideline, which will fundamentally change the way companies process revenue. On the services and fulfillment side, it is becoming difficult to process this data, which creates a nightmare for organizations trying to rapidly and accurately close their books. In today's webinar, we will discuss how you can resolve the challenges of manag managing the impact of fulfillment data on revenue recognition and the close process. With that being said, at this time, I would like to introduce today's speakers. I'm pleased to introduce Jeff Matthews, Director of Revenue from Tyler Technologies. Jeff has over 15 years of accounting experience and the past eight years focused on complex software revenue recognition. Jeff will be discussing how Tyler Technologies is currently optimizing their fulfillment process. Our second speaker is Greg Dav Davidson of ChangePoint. Greg has over 25 years experience in information technology support. Greg will be discussing how ChangePoint is used by the professional services organization and the data made available regarding fulfillment. Lastly, I'd like to introduce SoftTrack's Tom Zolli. Tom is currently the general manager at SoftTrack, has over 17 years experience with software companies, and for the past five years worked in the area of automating complex revenue recognition. Tom will be speaking to us today about how SoftTrack automates the revenue recognition process and data required from the PSA application to handle the fulfillment aspect. At this time, I'd like to hand it over to Jeff Matthews to get his perspective on today's challenges and areas of consideration. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Julia. So depending on your industry, how your sales cycles work, um, and your role in your company, some of these may be relevant and some of them may not. But for any closed process, the, the thing that we see that takes the most amount of time is gathering and recording the fulfillment data. That, that fulfillment data meaning <coughs> contract deliverables, invoicing timing, things of that nature that all flow into your financial statements at the end of a month, a year, or a quarter. In looking at fulfillment data, the things that you're really struggling with are, are our amounts accurate from both the invoicing perspective and the revenue perspective? And when I say amounts, I also mean timing. Do we invoice the proper amount at the proper time to the client per the terms and conditions of our contracts? Now, there are several things that you do with invoices. There are milestone invoices, meaning it's a point in time or they're tied to deliverables, such as services um, or some other type of deliverable. Those things all flow in from disparate systems oftentimes, so getting your arms around that can be challenging. On the revenue side of the house, <coughs> it, it's really separated. It depends on your industry. 
it can be separated from the invoicing process and oftentimes is separated from the invoicing process as the guidance around revenue is different from the guidance around invoicing. Um, and Julie, if you want to flip the slide, that would be great. So in my industry, in the software industry, because we supply core software, commercial off-the-shelf software, and services agreements, we have several different pieces of revenue guidance to contend with, each of which have different deliverable criteria or different criteria that would support your, your recognition of revenue and your timing. So the question that we always come up with is how do we know at the end of a quarter with as much business that comes in that we accurately and timely recorded everything that went through? And really the way that we do it, the, the only way I think you can do it with, with volumes is to use a system, a sales order system, an invoicing system, something that collects all of that information on the front end and allows you to analyze that data looking forward. Um, Julia, if you want to flip this slide. So when we take that context of recording everything as a sales order or as an invoicing system and we apply 606 to it, really the timeliness and the amount of your invoicing or your fulfillment information for invoicing won't change. You've got contractual triggers or business process triggers for your invoicing that you're going to follow. And 606 isn't really going to impact your fulfillment of invoicing obligations. Your amounts of time are going to be the same. What it is going to impact is your revenue. And the reason it's going to impact your revenue is unlike the environment we live in today where we have several pieces of guidance controlling revenue recognition, looking forward we have a single piece of guidance controlling revenue recognition. And unless you're in an industry where you don't offer discounts or you have a single deliverable in your contract, ASC 606 is really going to force you to look at the standalone selling price or the amounts that you are typically charge in an arrangement for a deliverable as opposed to what you're actually charging in your arrangement for a deliverable. And part of that is going to be the allocation of revenue and how you handle kind of capturing all of the elements, all of the deliverables in a contract and, and then how you separate those into your deferred revenue schedules or into your point in time revenue deliverables and things of that nature. And that's kind of really where, where the fulfillment data is going to come into effect because you're going to have to map the item that's being fulfilled to that allocated piece of revenue. And without doing that through a system, uh, really you're going to be in a manual process which is going to inherently increase your risk um, of material error. So in thinking about fulfillment in the current context of the environment we're in, it's a lot of information that comes in and, and there's a lot of risk around the accuracy and timing of that fulfillment. But looking forward at the future environment, not only do you have that same risk of gathering your fulfillment data, making sure that your timing is accurate, but you also have a matching exercise where you're going to have to match the fulfillment of the contract deliverable to the allocated amount of revenue for that contract deliverable. And, and that's going to considerably complicate matters going forward. So with all that being said, I think um, we'll turn it over to Greg Davidson to talk a little bit about how ChangePoint kind of automates that fulfillment piece and, and can help you capture those fulfillment details. Awesome. Thanks, Jeff. Um, ChangePoint and SoftTrack provides professional services automation, financial management, and revenue recognition. And you'll hear from Tom and I on how to solve those business challenges like Jeff Matthews from Tyler Technologies shared with us just now. Go ahead, Julia. ChangePoint sees the market in relation to PSA typically being the middle point or glue between CRM and ERP. CRM is well entrenched in organizations and ChangePoint can provide two-way integration that provides visibility, transparency, and financial accuracy to forecast information, specifically when professional services and product estimates are being provided. Ultimately, the information from CRM provides downstream revenue opportunities which reside and are managed going forward as work streams in ChangePoint. 
Revenue forecasts and actuals are tracked and executed in ChangePoint, providing both complete transparency and visibility to key stakeholders, including sales, services, and finance. As is, the, as is with the relationship with SoftTracks, ERPs can take financial information from professional services automation tools and provide necessary information to allocated, allocate and recognize re, uh, revenue. This transition is real time so that it can be as the information is being booked. Sorry, Julia, if you want to bring that slide back, we're still reviewed and approved. The fulfillment of change point billing and revenue information is fully flexible uh, from T&E to fixed fee and mixed engagements. Financial recognition rules can be set up and integration to ERPs such as SoftTracks can be done in real time and based on specific conditions and rules that match best practices and industry standards. Okay. Julie, if you want to go back one slide just out of order, my apologies. One more slide back. Keep going. <clears throat> what I wanted to highlight as well, um, from a ChangePoint perspective, a little bit of background on ChangePoint professional services automation. We've been in business for over 20 years as a software vendor and global leader in orders to cash lifecycle management. Strong, dedicated global presence, full API toolkit, um, managed to scale from simplistic to um, very complex. And it's a fully configurable model, uh, putting the deployment control within the customer's hand. Okay, go ahead, Julia. Two slides. Thank you. We've talked previously about the significant value, but just to be clear, ChangePoint can ensure better data integrity, financial rigor, and real-time visibility and transparency that will ensure better financial opportunity improvement and success. Key information that tightly couples ChangePoint and SoftTracks Revenue Manager ensures greater financial accuracy, stability, and success, and will provide financial leadership with a strong message to their executive counterparts. Next slide. PSA should be a vital part of your organization's success, and industry-leading analysts such as TSIA and SPI support the need for a professional services automation tool in the orders to cash lifecycle. And typically, those organizations see significant improvement in things like net profit and billable utilization with their organizations. Companies who don't take advantage of a mature and robust professional services automation tool like ChangePoint integrated with the likes of an ERP such as SoftTracks stand to lose out on that greater net profit and financial success. Go ahead, Julia. From a ChangePoint solution map perspective, uh, ChangePoint is the ecosystem of what I'll call business-driven components to ensure that greater financial stability with revenue recognition, or sorry, revenue, utilization, margin, and resourcing components designed to ensure that financial success. ChangePoint combines the depth and breadth of capabilities with technologies to provide that greater transparency and visibility and also provides key integration opportunities to ensure that seamless transition of data to and from the solution, along with key partner consulting to ensure a great, the greatest business value and success for organizations in the industry. Go ahead, Julie. As I've touched on, ChangePoint is the leader in the industry and provides that 360 degree coverage and visibility into all key professional services automation business processes, such as the engagement management, project management, resource management, and financial management. With standard integrations and touch points to the likes of SoftTracks Revenue Manager, ChangePoint can ensure a significant ROI resulting in the value, financial opportunity, and success. Go ahead, Julia. Now we'll hear from Tom Zali from SoftTracks, who will talk about SoftTracks Revenue Management. Okay, thank you, Greg. Um, so just a little bit of background on the company, and then I want to get into um, some specifics on um, 
um, 606 and the impact to the set of recognition. Um, in general, SoftTrax is focused on back office processes around, uh, I would say, revenue management in general, so billing, uh, recognition of revenue, et cetera. Um, for this uh, conversation today, because uh, I know a lot of people there are concerned about the impact of ASC 606, I, I'm going to focus the conversation on the, uh, the revenue recognition side of the equation. Um, and Julia, you can go down a slide. Um, so uh, just a little bit on soft tracks. I mean, we've been around for about 17 years. I, I think one of the most important things I could say is that we've been focused on revenue recognition um, in the world of you know, current U.S. GAAP and primarily focused really on the software vertical, although we cover you know, a number of them. I, I think what's important to understand is that, um, as, as Jeff mentioned, with ASC 606, there, there's there's literally you know over a hundred pieces of industry specific guidance that go away, and if you look at the the tenants of 606, there are a lot a lot of the complexities that have always existed in the software vertical uh, have have translated into 606, and I, I think it's really helped position us uh, it helps us leverage our our experience through you know literally hundreds of deployments of a solution to uh, to help people that are dealing with with ASC 606, and I'll, I'll get into a little bit of that as we as we go here. Um, so you can go down a slide, Julia. So I wanted to talk a little bit about um, you know what what we're doing in, in in a particular product called Revenue Manager, and this, you can just equate this to any revenue subledger, um, even if it's a component of an ERP system. Um, for most for many industries, the recognition of revenue can be very simple. I mean, if you're a, a, a retail shop and you're just selling something and immediately recognizing the revenue, it, I think it's very questionable whether that you need you even need a specific uh, revenue recognition engine. Um, for others, I think the revenue can uh, rec the recognition of revenue can get extremely uh, complex, and I want to dive into some of those scenarios as we go here. And I would say that. Um, you know, I would echo Jeff's point uh, earlier in the sense that any company that's selling uh, contracts with customers that consist of more than one deliverable, so like a multi-element arrangement um, in general, and I would say, you know, even more so those that, that discount uh, at the arrangement level are likely going to fall into some of the complexity that's inherent in ASD 606. Um, when, you, when you look at the types of things that have to be done in that situation, um, you see the major blocks in the um, in the uh, lower icon, uh, lower graphics. So there could be the the requirement to take a single a single line item, if you will, from a from an order or an invoice and separate it into um, uh, multiple performance obligations, uh, as they're described in the new guidance. Uh, there would be the requirement uh, potentially to allocate uh, the revenue uh, on the order across those performance obligations, and to do it against you know, some concept of, of a fair value. Uh, in ASC 606, it's, it's referred to as standalone selling price, but um, it's certainly in the software world, it's existed for a long time. You know, I would say under the general label of fair value, but you would have relative selling prices, uh, the SOE in some cases, um, best estimated selling price, third-party evidence. So all, all inherent in this allocation process. Um, and, and then there's just the ongoing scheduling of revenue. Uh, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. So I, I wanted to speak to the integration here because I think that um, if you look at the space for many industries right now, there, there's actually a fundamental flaw in the, in the flow of data through these systems. Uh, and when I describe that, I'm speaking specifically to the fact that in many systems, the, the recognition of revenue is actually triggered off the generation of the invoice. And uh, you know SAP, Oracle, uh, many of the others, all great systems, all originally designed for the manufacturing vertical, where you know some of these challenges didn't exist. If you notice in this diagram, um, you see a number of interfaces uh, between the ERP system and the and the uh, subledger. So certainly. Um, one of the first things you might see is that the initial data for the, the order uh, or coming into the recognition system is coming more likely from a sales order system or potentially even a CRM system. But 
typically upstream of the, uh, the invoice system. Um, now, there's, there's two reasons for that. One of them is if you are going to do an allocation, the guidance requires uh, this notion of total contract value. So if you are invoicing from one module in your ERP system for services, training, and things like that, and a different module for um, you know, the products that you sell, or if you are uh, not invoicing in total upfront, but invoicing you know, at multiple points in the future, you're just simply not going to have the data to establish total contract value uh, when the order comes in uh, and, and to support the initial allocation that's going to have to uh, occur against that order. And up. For those of you that aren't familiar with allocation, I have an example of it we'll get into in a minute here. So that's the first thing I would say. Um, the second is there is a, a, a present need and I think a growing need and, and certainly a good practice around you know, what we refer to as, as separation of the order to cash and the order to revenue processes and systems. And what I mean by that is that, you know, by triggering revenue recognition off the generation of an invoice and in, in you know, the former generation of systems, you're, you're effectively hardwiring your ability to, to alter the schedule of either of those. There's kind of a hard uh, linkage between the two. Better probably to, to, to keep the separation and, and such that, you know, you, you can tr treat recognition of revenue on a completely different schedule uh, as the, 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 the invoicing event. And so where this, I mean, this helps in some ways just in terms of establishing the total contract value, but I think it will be also very important to anybody um, out there that wants to or currently recognizes revenue ahead of billings, anybody who's manually accruing revenue. Um, and to support this, you know, it, it can save a lot of time if you set the system up the correct way. It does add complexity to the integration because you see now there's a second interface moving left from left to right where we're flipping revenue, uh, we are, even though we're taking sales order data in up front, establishing that total contract value, as those invoices come in, they're being applied against that revenue. Effectively, the challenge of the subledger is to keep track of all this, to move revenue from unbuilt, an unbuilt state to a build state as these invoices come in. Um, more complex, if you are, live in a multi-currency environment, there, there is some um, uh, adjustments that have to be made because you ha you bring in and start recognizing the revenue at the exchange rate on the date of the order, but you have to account for changes in the um, the FX rate uh, on the date of the arrival of the in invoices, and it could be multiple invoices. Um, and so, continuing to the right, you see the fulfillment events. So, um, and I'll speak to this in a little bit more detail, but the subledger. Uh, a good subledger, revenue subledger, should be capable of automatically detecting the type of revenue coming in and setting up the schedule for the revenue, whether it be milestone or uh, maybe it's on hold, you know, some kind of contingent revenue. Um, and so that's all fine, but there are, there are situations, and certainly if you run a big services business, there are going to be many situations where the recognition of that revenue is, is effectively what we would call an asynchronous event, meaning at the time the revenue, the order comes in, you know that the revenue is there, but you don't know when it's going to be recognized. You're waiting, for example, for maybe a customer to sign off on a, a milestone or a deliverable. Um, and, you know, Jeff alluded to the fact that that uh, collection of fulfillment data has been an, an anathema to a lot of CFOs, even under 605. And I, I'll explain how it gets more complex under 606. Um, so this interface, can solve that because all of those events, fortunately, if you're running a PSA tool like ChangePoint, you are tracking those events, all your time and materials billings, all of your uh, milestones, etc., and it can send triggers to the subledger. And the final interface is pretty straightforward: journal entries back to the general ledger. So, so that sort of sets the stage. So let's let's just uh, go to the next slide, Julian. We'll dig in a little bit here. Um, so. Uh, just a, a, a little plug on, a, on I'll say, a, a revenue subledger in general. I mean, what you're looking for there is to, to get the data into a, uh, a structured database um, and, and under control. And by getting it in, ideally all of it. So a lot of companies run side processes in Excel for more the complex stuff that they do. But there are a lot of things that get broken in that situation. You lose comprehensive audit. You lose a lose single point of control. You lose all the security features, et cetera. Um, and so you need, 
you need something that's flexible enough to get everything into it, which means strong business logic, and then you need strong reporting on top of it, um, and uh, and something that can scale, obviously, up, you know, from a few transactions a month up to, uh, we have clients that run hundreds of thousands a day. Um, so. Okay, next slide, Julia. So just, just to speak a little bit more um, on on sort of what I would call the simpler part of this uh, collection of fulfillment data. I mean, for those that don't have to allocate right now under 605, it, it's likely if you have a services business, you have this this problem. And so, you know, you need to be able to, uh, as I said earlier, set the system up to understand the different types of schedules of recognition that should be set up, whether it's point in time, ratable, milestone. Now, in, in our case, once those schedules are set up, I mean, they're set up automatically um, as the data comes in. Once the system's configured, it could be a million transactions a day, for, for that matter. Um, and then the next question is, what are the trigger events, just like Jeff described? And so those trigger events, whether they be milestone completion, delivery events, time and materials data, you could obviously, and maybe on an exception basis, you can do that in the UI, but I think far, far better to you know, have the integration where the events are occurring in change point. You make the decision um, whether you want your back office team, your revenue recognition experts to approve them before they affect revenue. Otherwise, they can just simply automatically trigger the recognition of the revenue. All of it is um, audited in a very structured uh, manner, so there's a trail, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I would say from our experience, I, I think there is a tremendous opportunity to reduce the close process for many companies. I think there's a tremendous opportunity to save manual effort, but I, I think all of that is, is uh, eclipsed by the uh, potential massive reduction in uh, human error that would occur through this automation. Um, so let's leave it at that and let's go to the next slide, Julia. Um, and I, I, what I really want to do now is talk a little bit about the complexities that I, I think in many cases we're finding are not fully understood um, um, uh, for companies uh, for which allocation is new. Um, so I apologize to those that are already doing allocation because this will be completely preaching to the choir, but I just want to define what we mean by allocation. And in this case, it's a proportional allocation. So this is some simple math where you have an order coming in, and it's a multi-element arrangement, and you have subscription, uh, you have consulting, training, hardware, and th these are all sold at a transactional value to the client, as you see in that um, selling price or extended selling price column, the requirement under ASC 606, um, and I could have included a discount here actually just to make it even more interesting, but the requirement under ASC 606 is that you uh, establish and maintain a standalone selling price. And if any of you have questions on that portion of it, you know, feel free to reach out to us um, you know, after the webinar. But bottom line is you, you have to establish these values, show that they're uh, Consistent, etc., and then you're effectively doing what's called a proportional allocation. It's done on every multi-element arrangement that comes in, uh, at least that's material. And so you see on the far right column the result of this allocation. If you look at the first line in the notes, uh, that that value, that six eight nine one, is, is is very simply derived by saying, okay, if I look at my standalone selling prices what is the proportionality between the standalone selling price of this particular component and the sum of the standalone selling prices on the order itself at 83000 And then I'll take that proportionality and multiply it by the total contract value, the total value of the order, and this gets back to why that, that number is so important to have, uh, to determine how much of the dollars I should allocate to this particular component. And you can see it sold at 10000 through this allocation process, it went down to six thousand eight hundred ninety-one and fifty-seven cents, and you can see that was done for all of the other components on the order. Now, you know, a good sanity check here is to make sure that the totals on the selling price and the allocated values are the same. You're not creating or removing revenue as part of this allocation process at the order level. You're just moving it around amongst the line items. Um, now, one of the big points I will make here is. You know, we described um, fulfillment events, let's say uh, percent of completion events or uh, application of some amount of dollars of services to a particular line item within the order. 
Uh, similarly, we talked about the application of, of future invoices to revenue to transition it from an unbuilt state to a built state. So let's, let's talk about that in the context of allocation. Um, you, you end up with a realization that the amount of revenue that's tied to a particular line item in the order, let's say subscription here, is different, potentially lower than what the transactional value was. The, the hard part here is upstream systems are not aware of, of unless they're doing some kind of a get, you know, API call into the revenue subledger to retrieve the value, they're otherwise not aware. So a billing system is going to sit there and say, okay, for this subscription, you know, I sold, I sold this, to, this total order had a value of 71500 The subscription was $10,000. I'm going to start invoicing that, and I'm going to do it over four invoices at 2500 $2, apiece, one per quarter. Um, if it just, mon you know, sort of um, mongoloid just applied those invoices to this revenue item, you'd be invoicing $10,000 against an item that only has 6891 allocated to it. Uh, same thing for fulfillment events where you're applying some, let's say, some absolute dollar value of cash against these items. My, my point there is that if, if you're managing this in spreadsheets, it's going to get very messy very quick. Even if you're doing it automatically through a, a system, or in this case, a combination of systems, change point and soft tracks, there's some fairly complex math that has to occur to uh, effectively understand, really, it ends up being the percentage of the transactional amount that you've invoiced to date and to do the right things against the allocated values. And, you know, I will say, we won't get into it in this webinar, but, you know, think about some of the other post-processing challenges that occur. So, for example, if you have to reset and reallocate, if you have things like uh, contract combinations or contract modifications that cause requirements for reallocation, you, you start to understand um, how messy this can get. And, you know, in the software world, unfortunately, people have been dealing with it for quite some time. In the ASC 606 world, a lot of this is new to a large number of uh, verticals. Um, and so, Julie, we can go down a slide here. Um, so just uh, to, to summarize here, a couple of major things to think about. One, you know, can I set my system up to capture total contract value? Um, uh, either as it stands today or, or through modification and using some of these um, available co components to kind of shore up your ERP system. Um, two, I would say, if you're going to make changes to your system, you know, really think about your business and, and think about whether or not you need to have this separation of order to cash and order to revenue. Um, I think even if you don't need it now, you may find that you need it in the future. Um, one of the things ASC 606 does, which is kind of nice, is it it allows in a number of situations for the acceleration of the recognition of revenue, which, which may drive this need. Um, third, I would say, you know, when you're dealing with the fulfillment events themselves, so let's say percent of the completion, which I am shortly changed to percent of transfer under 606 milestone and those others, um, you know, the, the events need to be captured um, carefully and pedantically in a system like ChangePoint. And then those triggers need to come to either your ERP system or a subledger like SoftTracks. Um, when those things move about, you know, one of the things you have to understand is that you have to be able to identify not just at the order level, but right down to the line item level, the, um, the target for these um, what we call post-processing events, but in this case fulfillment events. So when you set your systems up, you have to make sure that, you know, A, you have unique identifiers across the system. They're known at the time the orders come into uh, your order system, and they can be transferred to the systems that need them. So in this case, change point would be a system that would require it. It would need to then pass it to SoftTrack. Soft, well, SoftTrack is a system that would require it in terms of you know managing the revenue, but also change point would need to pass these identifiers from itself to SoftTrack such that it's performing the operation or the, the fulfillment trigger on the correct element within SoftTrack. Um, and then the final point, you know, dealing with an allocated world, um, you know, like I said uh, earlier, these upstream systems will not be aware uh, of the allocated value of the revenue item um, without, you know, significant complexity in the integration. That can be avoided as long as the revenue subledger is, is 
capable of understanding what a transactional value uh, impact is and translating it to an allocated value uh, impact. Um, and you know, one final point I would make here, and uh, you know, we can talk about it uh, further in the um, perhaps in the Q and A before I hand it back to Jeff. But um, people are asking us a lot now regarding how to adopt ASC six hundred six, and there there really are. Uh, two major options for adoption. Uh, one is something called full retrospective, and the other is called a modified retrospective. Um, in full retrospective, and I, I know perhaps many people on the phone are aware of this, but uh, on the web are aware of this. But in full retrospective, you're, you're effectively reprocessing your revenue over the, the prior two years. So public companies would be processing revenue from uh, you know the first period and. In, in, you know, usually around January 2016, uh, up through the uh, the periods that are ending after January 2018, when you um, when, when you have to start to report. Um, and private companies, everything is slid by a year, um, so 2017 and 2019. Um, these automated solutions are, are are good ones are capable of reprocessing the revenue. Um, that that is not the challenge necessarily. Um, a good one should be able to take in those original orders and deal with it. But what I would caution you on is that there's an issue of synchronization of events. And so I would focus any analysis you do on, you know, how am I going to get the initial orders in to be processed? Like I say, a simpler part of the challenge. What are my post-processing events? And how do they relate to other, other variables or values? So let me give you uh, an example of this. You know, if you're performing allocations, the implication is that you're doing those allocations against uh, a definition of standalone selling price, uh, just like you saw in that example. Well, those standalone selling prices do not exist for all time. The auditors will typically require you to recalculate those at least on an annual basis and sometimes on a quarterly basis. Now, way that you know, now you have a changing set of of standalone prices that can be stored in price books, but weigh that against uh, now reprocessing two years of data, all the post-processing events, all the allocations and reallocations, and the need to make sure that you're lining those up correctly with the fair values of the standalone selling prices that should have existed at the time that the orders were, uh, were processed, um, that can be a challenge. And if you're evaluating solutions or approaches to adopting 606, um, and this, you know, same thing in terms of fulfillment events, those synchronization issues are the ones that can burn you. I would say another example of this, uh, before I turn it back to Jeff, if you have um, a significant financing component in your, um, in your orders or your contracts, then you have to account for time value of money. So whether it's a net present value or a future value consideration, it will be a function of interest rates. Those interest rates could change over time. That could drive another synchronization event to be aware of as you post-process or do the look back for full retrospective. Um, and if you have questions on this, again, um, certainly feel free to reach out to us. Um, and with that, uh, Julie, you can go to the next slide. And uh, I'll turn it back over to, uh, to Jeff. Great. <clears throat> Thank you, Tom. Um, Julie, if you just want to go ahead. So given everything that we've heard here today, um, when you think about contract deliverables for money to cash, where can we improve? Or, or what do we have available to us? that kind of takes everything out of the manual processes, out of the human hands, and automates it. What we do using the Softrax and ChangePoint integrations is we set up our entire contract in the Softrax module. So we know the total contract value as of the point in time that we've signed the arrangement. Then we go ahead and set up within the same system all of our invoicing events. Are they time and materials? Are they milestone based? Um, what is it that we need to send to the customer for support in order to realize cash on these arrangements. And through that change point link, we can see the information and we can also report on that information. So if it's a time and materials type of a situation, then we can run reports and see what's been delivered, what's outstanding, what our accruals look like, things of that nature. If it's milestone, we can tell quickly what has been invoiced to the client and what hasn't, and do we have time-based events that should have been invoiced and weren't. Um, we know that all of these are accurate because they tie back to the total contract value that we've set up inside the Softrack system. So 
that really takes things out of the hands of, of the people processing or out of the hands of the people who might be responsible for those billing events or those order to cash events and really reduces the risk and ensures that our invoicing is accurate and timely since we know the dates for the events that are going to fill those obligations and we can report on those. So we want to go to the next slide. <clears throat> on the revenue side, part of this set up in our SoftTracks module is also establishing our total contract value as deferred revenue items. So we know as of the date of signature of the contract that our total contract value is sitting there waiting to be recognized. And as those fulfillment items come in from either change point or timing purposes or whatever that deliverable is that, that kicks off that recognition, we can look on a line item basis to our contract and to these deferred revenue schedules and ensure that our revenue is accurate, that we've recognized the proper amounts, and we can see the timing of those schedules to see if we've missed something. And that extends to our the software industry, our maintenance renewals, because we can also set up current and future maintenance renewals to the system, and we know that at a point in time we have invoiced all of our maintenance or we have still have maintenance items that need to be invoiced. So it's really all about looking at not so much capturing that fulfillment data at that point, but the ease at which we can tell that fulfillment data has already occurred and did we record it appropriately? Did we record the right amount? Did we record them in the right periods? Because all of that is in a system in front of us. If you're trying to do that kind of like Tom said, on a spreadsheet or through some other method of leveraging several systems with APIs or maybe an access database or something like that, you may have some difficulty in tying everything together and getting a good picture of everything in one place. Julie, so you want to go to the next one? So if we look at what we have available to us today in the current context of 606, and we are adopting SoftTrax Revenue Manager for 606, because of several things, but mainly because of the separation, like Tom said, of order to cash versus order to revenue, and the ability for 606 to do some of these synchronizing events with price books and things like that. Um, what it allows us to do in Revenue Manager is look at our entire contract that we've set up in our SoftTrack system, take that total contract value, and then based on our point in time standalone selling price books, allocate those revenues appropriately to each contract deliverable or each performance obligation under the new new guidance, um, which again reduces overall risk and gives us a, a good snapshot into what we're looking at both historically and going forward because we can model out based on point in time or based on expected fulfillment what our revenue is going to look like. And given the existing integration with ChangePoint, those fulfillment in points and touch points that come across, either they milestones, fixed fees, time and materials, they'll flow into the revenue manager and, and hopefully the intelligence within that revenue subledger will tie those fulfillment events to allocated revenue amounts. So that fulfillment or that automation of the fulfillment tracking and triggering of revenue, I haven't seen it. it it's It would be ideal, obviously, um, and that's the, the goal is to have that work. So one thing when you're thinking about 606 and the, the systems available to you and the automations available to you is this concept of standalone selling price. And that may be unfamiliar for a lot of industries, but that's really the backbone of establishing your allocations. And if you're not familiar with that concept, it's really something that's going to take a little bit of work to get there, but it is essential. And without it, you're kind of stuck at a, a total contract accounting method. Um, because you can't perform the allocations, and if you can't perform the allocations, then you really can't earn any revenue. So really, your opportunities for improvement under 606, as Tom said, a lot of revenue is going to be accelerated because things that you would historically limit under a myriad of other guidances for collectability considerations or for um, inability to separate the elements will go away. So your acceleration will occur as long as you can substantiate the standalone selling price. And one thing that Revenue Manager with the change point integration offers is the ability to record and utilize those standalone selling prices. So that's a really, really big piece of it to avoid that kind of risk of, of material misstatement or missing revenue due to timing or allocations of amounts. Um, and really that that's all we're doing on 606 right now is we're, we're 
doing post-processing on a lot of our standalone orders through the revenue manager to ensure that our revenue comparatives are accurate. All that being said, I'll turn it back over to Tom. Okay, thank you. Uh, Julia, it looks like we have some time for questions, so do you want to uh, maybe read off the first question? Absolutely. Um, we do have um, a question that came in for uh, ChangePoint. Um, Greg, the question is, is ChangePoint billing a separate activity from information provided to SoftTrack's revenue manager? It looks like we would have lost Greg there. Are you on mute, Greg? My apologies, I was on mute. There we go. <clears throat> yes, ChangePoint can provide or separate the billing activities from the revenue recognition process uh, and certainly from uh, what I'll call pre-invoicing to post-invoicing. Um, that revenue information can be provided through on a real-time basis uh, to revenue manager. I think Tom and, and Jeff had articulated that, but <clears throat> you can take things like your fixed fees, uh, the time and materials information, and transfer that through to Revenue Manager prior to the actual bill going out if the information's been validated and, uh, and approved um, prior to actually sending that invoice. Thanks, Greg. And then we have a uh, question uh, for Tom, and it says, can you speak more about how full retrospective adoption of ASC 606 and the complexities in the look-back period. Sure, sure. So um, one, one point I should make before I get into that actually is that um, you probably saw in the beginning of the um, slides that both uh, ChangePoint and SoftTrack have a long lineage. Uh, ChangePoint started in 96, we started in 99. Um, what we didn't state, but I think is an important point, is the the um, partnership between the companies goes back to 2003, so we've had a long-term partnership with ChangePoint, and it's been a very successful one. We use their technology here. Um, specific to that question, um, I can set the context by telling you the automation that exists currently. So certainly it's under 605, under current U.S. GAAP, there is, there is a requirement to move historical data into the system. Now, that data, we, we we tend to bifurcate that data into uh, two types. Uh, In-flight contracts, meaning that some of the revenue has been recognized, but there, there are still recognition events left versus, you know, what we would call truly historical data, meaning the, the recognition schedules have run out and it's fully recognized. In the past, um, we were able to build utilities to bring the truly historical data and even the in-flight data that has already been recognized into the system in a process form. Under ASC 606, you are processing that revenue under a new set of rules, and assuming that those, those rules uh, end up with different results, which is probably not all the time, but it's going to be probably the most, most commonly, then you really have to reprocess that data. And what that means is you have to take not only all of the contracts that, that were in flight at the time of the beginning of the look-back period, so early in 2016, um, into the system and process them, you have to reprocess all the change events that occurred to those contracts. And it's for some industries, I think it will be very simple, but for others, I think you start to get a sense of the complexity of this. One of the cautions that I would put out there, because I, I think it's getting extremely late in the game for companies to be full retrospective, um, what, what we are hearing from the big four audit firms, from people we know uh, within FASB, from the you know, enforcement agencies, the, the issue here is that if, if you don't adopt uh, on, the, on the timeline that's been put forth by, by FASB, then you could fail your audit. Your auditors could, could just not give you a clean opinion. And I think there's, you know, for public companies, that's kind of a very painful event. If you decide to adopt, and you decide to adopt uh, um, full retrospective, you will have to go through this look back um, or it, at a minimum prove that it's not material, which gets very close to going through this look back. If, if you decide, the other approach, um, sort of the modified retrospective approach, you, you're still disclosing deltas between revenue process center 605 and 606, but people think of it more like a, a go forward approach. Um, 
we are hearing that there's going to be implications to that go forward approach just from the perspective of consistency of revenue. So, you know, if you take that approach on the um, the report date, um, you'll be reporting another set of revenue, and there'll be sort of a potential unit step change in the revenue that you reported from 605 to 606. And and people are are talking of that having a a pretty heavy potential negative, um, you know, on the balance sheet, on the stock price, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, things to think about. And I think, you know, for companies that um, have not had to allocate in the past, one of the concerns that we have, I think that the auditors have, is that they may not realize that, that the complexities that are, are that are out there under 606, um, complexities to be talked about under fulfillment events, under allocation, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, keep in mind when you do if you if you do the full retrospective, you have those synchronization issues in time. You have to reprocess the data. You have to um, get up to speed very quickly on these concepts of fair value, proportional allocation, and and everything that they imply. Um, if you have, you know, scenarios are different company to company, industry to industry. So let me leave it there. But if you have further questions on it, you know, definitely give us a shout, and we can uh, we can walk through it. Thanks, Tom. And we have one um, other question that came in for uh, Greg at ChangePoint. Um, is billing and revenue recognition information available for reporting in ChangePoint? Greg, I think you're on mute. Thanks for the cue. Sorry about that. Uh, yes, the uh, billing and revenue recognition information is available. Uh, depending on uh, the process of the organization and that real-time integration, the revenue information that is sent over to Softrax would be available within ChangePoint. Uh, and with our flexible business analytics capabilities that we have, you can report on all aspects of billing, pre-billing, uh, as well as the revenue components. Thanks, Greg. And I think we just have time for one more final question. Um, this one's for uh, Tom. How is Softrax determining the standalone selling prices used in the allocation example? Okay, uh, that's a good question. So the, um, you know, at the end of the day, you, you have to obviously determine the standalone selling price. It, it varies industry to industry, situation to situation. Those values, um, you could think of it along three lines. Um, sometimes those values are determined outside of our system and just loaded in in terms of price books, and then they're maintained in price books against which this allocation occurs. Um, better, if, if your business is the type where you're proving consistency in the values through the examination of historical data, then uh, let me just speak generally first, and I'll speak specifically to the actual uh, to our product. But generally, what, what the auditors will typically do, and this was far more uh, restrictive under uh, 605 and, and DSOE as an example, but what the auditors will do is say that you have to look back at your historical data. Very often, it's standalone transactions of your historical data. Um, at least uh, you would have to find what I, what did you sell this this particular let's say product code for. Uh, on average, and it can get more complex than that because you could have a, a particular SKU that you sell at a you know, differently through different resellers, different regions of the world, etc. So there's certainly you can have multiple fair values for SKU, and 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 you know we handle all of that. Um, it can get more complicated than just a simple average. So that they may say, well, you have to determine what you sell it for on average, but you actually have to also prove to us that you're you're selling it consistently around that price. And so a, a very common um, approach to this is using something called a bell curve, where you're saying, OK, I'm going to run tests. And these tests are supported, again, within our sub-ledger. But I'm going to run tests uh, to, to prove that you know, I sold it x times over, let's say, the last year. Uh, and I'm going to sh you know, run the math to say that 80% you know, of the time, I, I sold it within plus or minus 15% of, uh, of the mean value or the average value. Um, those, those are some of the kinds of tests that the others will ask you to run. Um, further complicating things, however, some industries can't show that consistency. So, semi-custom manufacturing, you know, others where, you know, they have to fall back on other means, and so these fair values can be calculated also on the fly. And meaning that as an order comes into the system, you may look at, uh, 
you know, cost information that comes in, understand a margin, and what you're really doing is your fair value becomes really a static margin that you expect to make. And so it's an examination of the cost and the revenue against the static margin to drive the recognition of revenue. Um, another example of calculation on the fly would be if, if the fair value of a particular item on the order is actually derived from other things that are on that order, then on a transaction by transaction basis, order by order, the system has to be capable of, of understanding what's coming in, um, doing the appropriate math to then assign a fair value. Um, and then the fourth thing, just so that you know it's out there, there are situations, I think they're rare, but um, there are situations where you have to deal with uh, an override fair value, uh, which means something special is happening with a particular order and, and the, the standard fair value that should be applied uh, may not be applicable in this case. And so you may have the need to pass an override fair value in on the transaction um, and all of that is supported in the sub-ledger. But you know, if you're looking to, um, if you're concerned about 606 allocation and you're trying to figure out uh, what to do, um, I mean, if you're going to rip and replace your ERP system, I would look for some of these things and whatever you're going to buy. I think the, the, the time horizon for doing a rip and replace is basically over. If you're going to look, at, look for a sub-ledger to plug in, um, then I would look for these things and make sure they're supported. And like I say, if you have allocations, um, if you have the need to manage fair value, those, those things are not well suited to the world of spreadsheets. Uh, you know, I would I would only go there as an absolute last resort. Um, so. Thanks, Tom. And I'd also like to thank Jeff and Greg for speaking today. Um, thank you to our audience for joining us. Um, we didn't get to everyone's questions, but we will be following up with you individually. Um, we will also be going to send out a recording of the webcast within the next 48 hours. And if you have any product-specific questions, you can reach out to us at the above contact information. Uh, we hope you enjoyed today's webinar and hope to see you again in the future. Thank you.